Welcome to lecture 11a. This is Understanding the Bard, Keys to Unlocking the Mysteries of Shakespeare. Quick bio, Shakespeare lived between 1564 and 1616, so late 16th and into early 17th centuries. His birthplace is a small town in England known as Stratford-on-Avon, and he was educated, but not so far as university. He did get married at a fairly young, by our standards, age to a woman, Anne Hathaway, not the actress, but a <laughs> much older Anne Hathaway. Um, she was quite a bit older than he was, and together they did have three children. He was in London by the time he was in his 20s, performing with a theatrical troupe run by a fellow named Burbage. And as your bottom bullet point explains, at this point the Protestant Reformation had happened on the European continent. Remember when we read Dante that I told you the Catholic Church was in complete control in Europe. Martin Luther had broken with the Catholic Church on the European continent from 1517 and then a couple of decades after that you may be familiar with the story about King Henry VIII breaking with Rome um, so that he could get a divorce. So by this time the Church of England has been established in England and this had set off a lot of religious controversy. Um, one of the groups that formed was the Puritans and they were opposed to the theater. They thought the theater was sinful. So um, to escape the criticism of the theater, Burbage and his troops moved their theater outside the London city limits at that time. So they went to the south bank of the River Thames, technically away from the city, and worked in a place called the Globe Theater, which today has been restored and you can tour, not the very original Globe, but a replica of the old Globe. Um, Shakespeare lived through two different British monarchs, Elizabeth I, who is most famous for beheading her Catholic sister, uh, Mary Queen of Scots, for being Catholic. Sorry, that was her cousin, not sister. And then after she died, the throne was assumed by King James I in 1603, and he's also the same King James that we associate with the translation of the King James Bible. You'll notice that the uh, language of Shakespeare and the King James Bible are the same version of English. Um, it's important to remember that um, theatrical companies depended on the approval of the monarchy for patronage and how that works out in terms of what they write about and what they do on stage is something we'll talk about during this unit. A few themes to note when you read this or any other Shakespeare play. If you've got this kind of stuff in your toolkit, it will be a lot easier to decipher these plays. A key concern for Shakespeare was the use of power, how it's distributed, how it fluctuates, so it's not absolute. Um, people have different degrees of power. How do those who have a lot of power, such as kings and um, you know aristocrats and so forth, how do they use it? What are the consequences of that? It's not always pretty. Um, those who have less power or less direct power don't usually sit back and just be passive, however. They find ways of attempting to act in their self-interest. So what do they do? How does a working class person or a woman or someone of lower social status attempt to get what they want if they can't just get it directly? So social class is also an important issue for Shakespeare in almost every play, one of the things that sometimes confuses my students initially is that there will be a main plot going on that usually addresses the concerns of aristocrats, and then there will be a parallel kind of subplot or comic relief or something going on between working class characters who often speak a kind of working class dialect that can be hard to read. It's easier to understand if we actually hear it performed. So. Um, one of the reasons was that Shakespeare wanted to encourage attendance at the theater of people of all social classes, so he tried to put something in there to appeal to everybody. Um, if any of you watched Downton Abbey, the show that recently finished on PBS, it's sort of a modern day update of that same idea that we're going to look at what's going on at two different levels with the aristocracy and with the working class characters. Um, disguise is a very uh, frequent motif that we see in Shakespeare's plays. There's almost always a, uh, 
a scene where somebody is pretending to be someone else or is hiding behind a curtain or is um, pretending to be something they're not in order to discern some kind of truth. And that, of course, raises the issue, can we always believe what, they, what we see? Is what we perceive always correct? How easily are we deceived? What are the consequences when we believe things that are incorrect? What are the consequences of gossip? What are the consequences of disguise? Um, as we'll see in the next slide, that can be tragic or comic. Uh, the relationship between theater and life, the idea that all of our lives are sort of playing roles, shifting from one role to the next, um, the relationship between spectating and participating. There's usually a play within a play in every Shakespeare story, and there is in this one as well. Um, Shakespeare was always so keenly interested for his time in what motivates characters. So there's a psychological depth and an insight into individual motivation that we often didn't see in literature prior to this time. So I think that's why a lot of these stories still have staying power today, even though in some ways they're quite archaic. We've talked a bit about consequences of power, consequences of disguise, just consequences in general. One thing needs to the next, and if the characters can't see them coming, to what extent are they or are they not responsible for what turned out in the end, whether it's good or bad. So we'll talk more in a few minutes about the relationship between the tragic ending and the comic ending and how sometimes the difference can really turn on a dime. And then um, social norms and the extent to which individuals wish or do not wish to conform to them, um, particularly gender roles is something that comes up frequently in Shakespeare. Often we see his characters struggling against what is expected of them. A couple of hints that I think will aid in your understanding of the language. The first is to realize that the word order is almost usually inverted from what we're used to hearing today. So again, if we think about our friend Yoda from Star Wars, he says things like, judge me by my size, do you? That is just how Shakespeare might have phrased it. So to be or not to be, that is the question. Um, today we might say, the question is, or I'm wondering about, um, so things come in the opposite order that you're expecting. Uh, another thing that can sound sort of quaint and strange to our ears is the fact that the characters are almost always speaking in poetry. Um, we call it blank verse because it's unrhymed poetry, but it still is poetic because it has a rhythm. The specific rhythm is called iambic pentameter. Pentameter, of course, refers to five meters, and a meter has two feet. So if we do simple math, we'll see that a line of the iambic pentameter has ten syllables, with the accent usually on the second syllable. So for in that sleep of death, what dreams may come. It sounds a little bit like horses going down the street. Da-da, 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 da-da. So um, not a particularly natural way of speaking, but that's the way most of the dialogue is constructed. There are some exceptions. Another thing that makes Shakespeare challenging is his fr frequent use of both classical references to Greek gods and legends and so forth, as well as his allusions to um, historical events that we may not be all that familiar with today. So here it helps to read the glossary he also uses some archaic words and expressions. Um, like Mary is kind of like, hey, <laughs> it doesn't mean a lot. Anon, for soon, you'll tune into some of these um, thing, expressions like what ho. So some of it, again, is kind of archaic, and here your glossary will help. Um, Shakespeare often wanted to discuss contemporary issues without looking like he was critical criticizing anyone in particular that he knew, particularly the seated monarch for reasons that I went into earlier. So what he would do is put things in fi fictional settings or foreign settings. So he wanted to talk about abuse of power. He wouldn't write a play about Queen Elizabeth. He would set it in Italy or in our case Denmark. So often he's invoking these kind of foreign settings when he's really trying to talk about something that's going on right there right now sort of like Star Trek does today. They bring up contemporary issues, but they pretend that it's happening in outer space.
And then um, another last thing that can make him confusing is that, as I said earlier, there's often a parallel plot up um, that affects the working class. And it sometimes can be hard to see what these new characters have to do with the main plot. <laughs> they're always there. Often their dialect, too, is very working class and difficult to read. It can make more sense if you try to read it aloud or if you're somehow able to hear it. Sometimes these parallel plots serve to provide comic relief even in the tragic plays. In the case of Hamlet, when we get to act uh, toward the end of the play, we'll see that the gravedigger scene is kind of played for comedy even though we're about to reach the tragic conclusion. And then finally, the scene changes are often not introduced. You're just sort of expected to kind of go with the flow and know what's going on. So sometimes when scenes change, you might not be completely clued in right away to who the people are or what's happening. A little bit about irony, which we'll talk more about next week. The three types I'd like to introduce you to today quickly are situational, verbal, and dramatic. And I've got some examples here that are pretty self-evident. Situational is where what happens seems really incongruent with what you expected to happen. So a tragedy at a wedding, or if we wanted to invert it, maybe someone getting engaged at a funeral. <laughs> These are ironic situations. Um, you win the lottery on the same day you get news that you're terminally ill. It's yeah, grim, but situational irony. Verbal irony is closely related to sarcasm, though not always. This is when the meaning stated is actually the opposite of what you really mean. So, um, nice outfit, dude. Um, a lot here, tone is a clue whether it's meant ironically or not. If I said, nice outfit, dude, you might think that I actually meant that. And if I said, huh, nice outfit, dude, you'd probably think, oh, she means the opposite. Um, words that we use today, like saying something is sick to mean it's really good, that's actually an ironic use of the word sick, since it's more common prior meaning was to mean bad. And then last, we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about this next week, dramatic irony. This is when we as the audience know things that the characters inside the story or the play don't know. So um, we'll see as we the story unfolds that in Hamlet, there's a scene where Polonius is hiding behind the curtain as Hamlet tries to talk to Gertrude. And Hamlet thinks it's the king. So the stories of that, the sorry, the consequence of that is going to be tragic and it's going to kick off what happens in the rest of the story. The fact that we know it and he doesn't is a key part of what um, shapes the whole play. And of course, the source of dramatic irony can result in tragedy, as it does here, or it could be comic. This is the case in farces when we know that two people are actually, say, not having an affair, but it looks to the characters in the play like they are. So that would be a farcical comic use of dramatic irony. In this play, the consequences, of course, are tragic. Okay, and a little bit just about Hamlet to set you up. It's probably the single most well-known and often performed play that we have. Shakespeare's still the most performed author, and this is probably his kind of uber work. And a lot of the lines and scenes and characters and motifs are still very much at play in the culture around us, whether we know it or not. You might find yourself reading along and thinking, oh, that's where that expression comes from. Things like every dog has its day, that's in here. To be or not to be, that's the most famous one. So it's kind of fun to be looking for those as they come along. The setup is that the King of Denmark had uh, killed the father of the Norwegian prince, Fortinbras, who's presently on a military mission in Poland, and then Hamlet Sr. himself had been killed. So the play opens with Hamlet Sr.'s ghost appearing first to the watchmen, and then to his son, little Hamlet's friend, Horatio, and then finally our Hamlet, the one that the story is written after, I call him here Hamlet Jr., um, he appears and speaks to his father's ghost, and the ghost will tell him um, I didn't die by accident. It was actually my brother, your uncle, who killed me. He did this because he wanted to marry my wife, your mother. You need to seek revenge. And that is the scene that will kick off everything else that is to come. And um, just so you get the family tree here, there's a pompous court official 
named um, Polonius, who's always giving advice. He often doesn't follow his own advice. Um, he, he is the one who comes out with the famous line, this above all, to thine own self be true. Um, one of those things in our culture that I just mentioned. He has two children, Laertes and Ophelia, and Hamlet was once in love with Ophelia, and that, that's gonna go kind of sour, playing spoiler here. She has a brother named Laertes who was Hamlet's friend and then things are going to happen that um, cause that friendship to kind of fall apart. And again, that is what will lead to the tragic consequences. And at this point, I will leave the reading up to you. As usual, please feel free to contact me this week if you have any questions.